the Travel Squad Podcast. We're four friends that grew up together in the same small town. We followed each other to San Diego, and now we adventure the world together. One passport stamp at a time. We're here to share our travel stories and inspire you to go on your own adventures. Even if it starts with your own backyard. I'm Jamal. Brittany. Kim. And I'm Dana. And And we're we're the the Travel Travel Squad Squad Podcast. Podcast. So grab your ticket, your passport, and don't forget your travel insurance. And prepare for takeoff. Hello, fellow travelers. Hello. Hello. Hey. Welcome to episode 38 of the Travel Squad podcast. Today, we are taking you with us on a three day weekend getaway to Carlsbad Cavern National Park and Guadalupe Mountains National Park for my birthday weekend. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Thank babe. you. As you guys already know, we love to explore the national parks, and it is on our bucket list to visit them all. So we got to cross off two on this trip. It's also on our bucket list to visit all 50 states. And again, over this weekend getaway, we were able to scratch off two more states because Carlsbad Caverns is in New Mexico and Guadalupe Mountains is in Texas. Well, this was not a squad trip. Carlsbad Caverns looks pretty cool and I can't wait to hear about it. But I was not included on this trip because this was, like Jamal said, his birthday trip. And Brittany added on some time to meet up with your sister and family in Dallas. Kim, don't feel too bad because my invite got lost in the mail as well. But Jamal, Feliz Navidad. Gracias. (laughs) Gracias. <laughs> All right, guys. So take it away. Let us know what happened. So we left San Diego on Thursday after work. We flew into Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we stayed there overnight before driving to Carlsbad Caverns. This was Jamal's birthday. Yeah, Thursday was my birthday. Both Brittany and I worked that day. We had the last flight out of San Diego direct to Albuquerque and got in that Thursday night. And we spent the night and woke up. And when we woke up, we went back to the airport to pick up our rental car for our five-hour drive to Carlsbad Cavern, which is in the southern portion of New Mexico, where Albuquerque is more north. So it was a five-hour drive to get to Carlsbad Cavern. I don't know if Zaina, you know this, or Kim, you know this, but Jamal was giving me shit the entire plane ride and drive because he did not want to go on this trip. Like he (laughs) says, every year he doesn't want me to plan anything for his birthday. And every year I plan something (laughs) for his birthday and it usually involves hiking. So he did not look like a happy camper at all at the beginning (laughs) portion of this trip. That's untrue. I had a very positive attitude on the plane and for the trip. I, my bad that attitude was maybe before when you were telling me you were trying to plan something. And again, I would just want to reiterate, I always tell you I would like to one year just relax and do nothing on my birthday and you take over and don't even give me my birthday wish. But that's neither here nor there. On your 100th birthday, I will let you rest. <laughs> You'll kill me by then, I'm sure. <laughs> so tell us about the drive to Carlsbad. So New Mexico, very desolate state, very beautiful though. Mind you, I mean, we've said this before in previous episodes, the desert really is beautiful. There's some majestic beauty about it. Some people could see it and think it's barren, but definitely beautiful. But there is not a lot out there. And actually on this drive, I ended up getting a ticket, believe it or not. What? Yeah, I got an out of state ticket for speeding. So how fast were you going? Well, do you know why I pulled you over, sir? Yeah, (laughs) I was speeding, but I don't think I told the officer or that. But anyway, to your point, Zane, of how fast I was going, we're out in the middle of nowhere in the New Mexico desert, and we're no longer on the interstate. We're on a New Mexico state highway, which is, you know, a little one lane road traffic each way in each direction. And a lot of those isolated roads pass through little towns, right? And it's still part of the highway, even though it goes through town and there may be stoplights, stop signs, etc. And we're coming up on this town and I see that they're reducing the speed limit because we're coming up to a town and then it goes from you know 65 to 55 to 45 and I could see the signs and I am in the process of starting to slow down granted I could probably have slowed down a lot quicker than I did but I was still well outside the town limits or where there was actual buildings of the town 
down. And that's actually where the cop was. He was hanging out over there on the front side, apparently had his radar gun. And as I'm in the process of slowing down from going my 65 miles an hour, I'm probably still at 60 in the 45 zone, but I'm working my way to slowing down. And he just flipped on his lights, pulled me over, didn't care that he saw that my birthday was the day before. He just decided he wanted to give me an out of state ticket. (laughs) I didn't want to fight it, but I'm like, dude, like I'm clearly slowing down. You have these signs honestly within 100 feet of each other at a 10 mile difference I know, what like you slowing down slam on your brakes yeah you see it? so Brittany didn't let me live that one down and i looked at her and i said well this inexpensive trip has just gotten more expensive and technically it's your fault because i wouldn't have gotten this ticket if we stayed home so actually, <laughs> you bring up a good point though so how do you deal with out-of-state tickets really really good point i learned that myself i was expecting it to be expensive because tickets here in california are ridiculously expensive and And he told me, he's like, yeah, I mean, you can appeal it and you would have a phone call with a judge or you can just plead no contest and pay the ticket. And I said, well, how much is the ticket? And he's like, it's $86. I was like, I'll just pay the ticket (laughs) because I was expecting like a $300 speeding ticket Mm -hmm. price like you have here in California. Yeah. So he was able to just go online, pay the ticket and have it said and done. But that was the... Is it on your permanent record? I don't think so. I actually didn't have any points go against me on my insurance. No increase. I wonder if since they're out of state and it's speeding and you just kind of settle it, I didn't have to go to traffic school. I didn't have to do anything, but I don't know if that's out of the norm necessarily. So that was the only unfortunate thing about this awesome weekend getaway was that ticket. But I did get a little bit more excited as we continued on because we drove through Roswell, New Mexico, which is famous for its aliens. local lore. Yeah, <laughs> famous for its aliens. Did you see any aliens when you were in the area? We saw several yeah. on the top of the light posts. All of the light posts on the main road through the city were shaped like little alien heads. Aww. Aww. And so when you drive down the street, you can also see billboards for alien museums and like go to the UFO site potentially. So they amp it up in this area. Yeah. So for a lot of people who don't know, Roswell, New Mexico is very famous for the local lore that a alien spaceship actually crashed in Roswell in the 1950s. And the town still talks about it, hypes it up, and it's a whole tourist industry out there. I really wanted to stop. I'm really into UFOs. I don't need to necessarily go into my beliefs on it, but I think the topic is so, so fascinating. And we just didn't stop for whatever reason because we were on our way to Carlsbad Cavern. But the reason why people truly do believe that an alien spaceship crashed is in the 1950s when it happened, the U.S. government actually came out and said, yes, an alien spaceship has crashed. They published that information in the paper, confirmed that an Air Force general confirmed this. And then they what? retracted the story and said, no, 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 it was just a weather balloon that crashed. That was what? wrong. But originally when the story was aired, it was confirmed and reported by an Air Force general or somebody high up in the Air Force that, yes, it was a UFO. So did it happen? Did it not? I don't know, but it makes for an exciting story. Yeah. And that- area draws tons of tourists due to the amount of alien paraphernalia they have in the city. So was that its only UFO sighting or have there been others? I don't know if they have had any more sightings in that area. I wouldn't be surprised, but it is said that of that crash, they retrieved the crashed spaceship and there were supposedly two aliens that were alive that they retrieved. Is it true? Is it not? I don't know. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, who knows? But I wish we had time to stop. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, we didn't, but we continued on through Roswell and made our way to Carlsbad Cavern. Yeah, so we were staying in a town called Carlsbad. And just a squad tip is there is no cell reception on some parts of this drive. So make sure, again, I've said this before, to download offline maps. Also, this happened to be the same weekend that my sister was moving to Dallas, Texas. And she was driving there. She was driving there with my niece. From California. They used to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. So it was going to be a long drive for them. And so they were breaking it up in segments. And so one of the stops that she was going to make was to 
to El Paso to visit one of our cousins, Rita Mae, and her now husband, Jose. So they stopped in El Paso, and I convinced all of them to meet us at Carlsbad Caverns because it's only about a two and a half hour drive from their hometown. So we kind of told them we think we're going to be there at approximately 1 p.m. And they said that they would aim to do the same, which was really great because we had no cell service at Carlsbad Caverns. So we just literally had to meet up at the visitor center and just hope that each other was there at approximately the 1 p.m. time. Wow. And we actually happened to all arrive around that time. So it worked out perfect. Now we've mentioned it before. We're on our way to Carlsbad Cavern, but we haven't even really talked about what Carlsbad Cavern is. I personally got confused because in North County of San Diego, we have a city called Carlsbad. So when you said you were going to Carlsbad Cavern and you were getting a hotel or whatnot, I thought to myself, well, why don't you just come home? Really? (laughs) I'm serious. (laughs) So we all arrived there at the same time and we've been mentioning Carlsbad Cavern, but we haven't really talked about what it is. It is a giant cave that they have underground in the southern desert portion of New Mexico. And so the visitor center, like any national park is where people do their souvenir shopping, you could buy your tickets, etc. But from the visitor center, they have a giant elevator that takes you down about 75 stories into the cave. Now the entrance into Carlsbad Cavern is $15 per person and year round in the cave, it's always 56 degrees Fahrenheit and it's humid in there. And that was one of the draws on why I wanted to go for Jamal's birthday is because inside the cavern and the cave, it is a constant temperature. So even though outside in the summer, it's very, very hot inside of the cave, it's nice and cool. And so that was a really big draw for me and why we can complete it over Jamal's birthday weekend, which is in July. Most caves have a consistent cave temperature all year round. And like I said, from the visitor center, they do have the elevator that takes you down into the cave. I thought that was so unique. I've never been to a national park where when I'm in the visitor center, I have to take an elevator to even get into the park because the whole top of the park, there's not really anything there to see. It's all desert. You have to take that elevator down. There is a natural entrance to the cave, which you can hike down, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but most people don't do that. They take the elevator from the visitor center where you buy your tickets. And so inside of the cave, of course, you're going to see magnificent cave structures. And one thing I want to point out is you are going to be tempted to touch them, but please do not touch the natural calcite structures and formations inside. Just the oil on people's hands can ruin and cause the formation to stop forming. Wow. Yeah, because when people put their hands on it, it puts a layer of oil on the structure and then it can ruin all of the structures for the future because they're still forming. Oh yeah, when I was in Belize and I went through the old Mayan caves, one of the absolute requirements was you had to have socks because when we eventually got to the place where we climbed the rocks they didn't want your natural oils on the rocks like you had to have socks in order to do the trip yeah so these calcite formations that Brittany is talking about is the stalagmites and stalactites so just enormous enormous structures i mean you go in there you see photos of caves and until you really see it in person it just doesn't do it any justice i mean i could sit here for 30 minutes trying to just describe to you how beautiful it is and i'll say it again it was beautiful but you have to see these things in person to really understand stand. It's just so amazing. Jamal, how do you remember what is a stalagmite versus a stalactite? Yeah, good question. They're all really the same thing. They're those calcite formations and pillars, but a stalagmite grows from the ground up and a stalactite grows from the ceiling down. And how I remember that is it has to hold tight to the ceiling so that it doesn't fall. So stalactite is what's on top. Stalagmites are the ones on bottom. Oh, there you go. And it has to be mighty to push through the ground. I never thought about it that way. My geography teacher and geology teacher, they taught me the tight as the way to remember it. So that's how I remember it. Hold tight to the ceiling. And there's lots of different calcite structures depending on how the water runs. So if the water runs along a cave wall, it can form structures called drapes or curtains. They have ones that look like popcorn. They have other ones that look like soda straws. It's like the start of a stalactite typically. Yeah. And how and why these things form is simply because all the water that's coming through the limestone cave structure 
pressure, it is creating calcium deposits. And those calcite deposits, eventually, once the water drains, will eventually harden up. So it's millions of years to create those layers coming down for the stalactites or for the stalagmites. I hear that if you walk under a stalactite structure and water drips onto you, it's good luck. Have you guys heard that? I have no. not. Did you guys have water drip on you? I've had water drip on me several times. I should be showered in good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it too as well. Because this is not my first time in a cave, but it's the first time in a cave this grand that I really, really remember. And it's just so impressive. So when you go down the elevator, you are in what's called the big room. And they have a specific trail that you can take around the big room. And it's just one large open area. Yeah, the big room is the largest single cave chamber by volume in North America. And as we mentioned on our Adriatic coast trip, we have mentioned that we went to another cave in Europe, which was the single largest cave chamber in Europe by volume. So Jamal and I have visited both the largest single cave chamber in North America and Europe. Yeah. And the trail around the big room is about one and a quarter miles and it's relatively flat and you can take the elevator up and down. So it is handicap accessible. And we did see some people on the trail that were in wheelchairs. So it is paved and it is handicap accessible and again, relatively flat. Mm. It's not like a tour, is it? You can go off and explore on your own. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not like a tour at all. So wait, so you're 75 stories down there. So like, do they have bathrooms or do you have to go to the bathroom outside? Great question. So they do have bathrooms in the visitor center before you get into the elevator. But if you got to go while you're in the cave itself, right next to the elevator, they do have a bathroom. So there's only one bathroom in the whole cave area. And it's actually really cool because it's built in part of the cave. Cool. Interesting. Because it's so far down. So I'm like modern plumbing and water. Yeah, like no, just, really good question. Yeah. They somehow did that. And there are restrooms down inside of the cave. Cool. So did you guys like walk up at all the 75 stories? Yes. Yeah, so easy day. It turned into an easy day as you know it. So like Brittany said, we were with her sister, our niece, and then Brittany's cousin. And at the time, her fiance, now her husband, since they live in El Paso. And again, Brittany's sister was moving to Dallas. It just worked out perfect for that timing. So we all did the big room trail. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a natural entrance to the cave. So you can go from outside without taking the elevator and they have a natural entrance trail that comes into it. Well, instead of taking the elevator back up, after we did the loop, we hiked our way out the natural entrance. Yeah. And what I want to say too is while you're on the loop and on the natural entrance, there are little posts of what structure you're seeing. It tells about the history. It tells about the formation. So even though you're on your own, it is interactive and you can learn a lot about what you're seeing. It's not just like you look at it and not know what's going on. So the natural entrance, we took that trail. It's about a mile and a quarter and it's very steep. So like we said, we went down the elevator that was 75 stories down. So just imagine hiking that up. It ends up being about 800 feet. I mean, essentially it's equivalent to walking up 75 stories. Yeah. Was it crowded? Like, do you have a lot of people on that? You know, more people come down it than hike it up. So it is still the same trail, regardless of which way you're going. So there was more crowds coming down than up, but a lot of people were going up. It was difficult and steep, but what made it a lot easier is clearly you're inside, you're in a cave and it's 56 degrees. So it was cool. So you really didn't feel that you were getting as tired as you were because you were staying in a comfortable temperature and that made it a lot easier. Uh, the last time I was in a cave, it was super hot and it was with Kim in Cuba. <laughs> well, that, was, hot and that, sweaty. That, that was a party cave. This is a, a real cave here. But yeah, that was a real cave too. Well, just Cuba. imagine this. It's underground. So anything underground is going to be pretty cool. You know, it doesn't have any natural sunlight hitting it. Right. Yeah. So we did see a few highlights. There was a place called Devil Spring and it was a large cave pool and it had a whole bunch of stalactites sticking out of it and a whole bunch of columns that were coming out of it. One thing that I learned was people want to put pennies in the pool and that can mm -hmm. ruin the structures and the minerals that are in this natural area and discolor the water. So be mindful of that. Don't do that. Don't touch things. Just be respectful of the nature and the environment. It's there for everyone to see and enjoy. Yeah. And when Brittany said columns, we didn't touch upon this. A column is when a stalagmite and stalactite Ooh. actually meet and form as one. Sounds so pretty. So their 
there was lots of them in there as well. And another interesting formation that we saw was Iceberg Rock. And it's a 200,000 ton rock that has fallen from the ceiling. And as you're hiking up the natural entrance, there is a sign where you can see them say, this is where the rock fell, but you could only see the very top portion of it. You can't even see the bottom. And that's why they call it Iceberg Rock. Because like a natural iceberg, you could only see the very, very little bit of the top and not the big portion that's below the water. So that was really, really cool to see. I mean, I can't imagine being in that cave when that 200,000 ton rock fell. Could you imagine the echo oh <laughs> or the vibration that would go on in there? Well, the thought that I had was how long ago was that? That must have been a while back because I mean, it has to be safe nowadays for you guys to be able to walk that area. Yeah, it was like millions of years, I think. <sighs> back when that happened. Yeah, I don't know the specific time frame, but definitely well before people were even in the cave and it was known. Well, if no one was there to hear the fall, did it really fall? I'm just kidding. You know that the, the, <laughs> the joke about the tree, if a tree falls in a forest, did it really fall? Never mind. Guys. I have a question about this. So the park has the caves. That's what the park is known for. Yes. Are there caves in other parts of the nearby area? Or is this just really just the park? It's just really the park. I'm sure there's other caves, but this one is just so big. So in the surrounding area, I'm sure they have them. But just in comparison, it's not mm. anything that's as grand uh-huh. as this. And like Jamal said, you can only see the tip of ice iceberg rock but if you do the cave down and you walk down it you see the tip and then as you continue to go down into the cavern you can see more of the base and see how massive it is at the bottom i also want to point out that while you're in the cave you can only bring in water so you can't bring any food any other drinks except for just water make sure to bring a jacket because it is chilly down there and if you are cave lovers and you've been to other caves they are very strict about what clothing and gear you can wear into caves and you have to answer when you buy your ticket if you've been into another cave recently and where it is because there is something called white nose syndrome and it's a fungus that has wiped out millions of hibernating bats and so they don't want you to bring gear from other cave systems in because it causes that fungus to grow and then they don't want to wipe out their bat population yeah and that's one thing too beyond that they do ask you if you've been in other caves so you don't bring any of that bacteria that virus etc but as you're hiking up or down the natural entrance, that's when you start to really see the bats and you can start to smell the bat guano and see them around there. Well, that's nature, Kim. I don't know what else you (laughs) want to say, but it's really cool. Are they rabid? No, they are not. So they're safe. They're not going to bite you or attack you? No, they just fly around. Some of them fly around. Some of them are just hanging out on the structures. So if you were in the cave in the big room, if you turned off all the lights, it would be pitch black. It's very dimly lit. It's beautiful down there. And then as you go up, it's still dark. But as you start to make your way to the natural entrance, you get your first glimpse of sunlight. So it's really cool to see. You can feel the weather change as well. You'll start peeling off those layers, taking off that jacket because you're going from the cool 56 degree cave into New Mexico summer temperature Mm -hmm. that we were in. So from the time you went down to the cave to the time you came out, about how long were you down there? I would say about three hours. I would say the same. Because the hike up took a little bit of time, not as long. I would say maybe that took 45 minutes from the bottom up, you know, just allotting for how many people were with us, with her family, breaks, taking a little rests. And looking at everything. But yeah, you spend a lot of time looking like a mile and a quarter is not that much. But when you're stopping to really look and take photos and just admire it, it takes a long time out of there. But we hiked our way out. And afterwards, we left Carlsbad Cavern just for the day. And we ended up celebrating my birthday dinner at Chili's. Mm -hmm. Nothing too exciting, but I do want to say this. The entire industry and town around Carlsbad Cavern National Park is because of Carlsbad Cavern National Park. Just how we talked about on our Bryce Canyon episode, everything around there is centered around the industry of people coming to Bryce. Same thing. So hotels are expensive there because there's nowhere else to stay or for what reason. Food wise, there's no really good mom and pop shops. They're all just really chain style restaurants like 
like Chili, Subway, <laughs> Sonic, Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, so that's what you can expect when you're there. Okay. So we did that. And speaking of expensive hotels, we were lucky to even find our janky hotel for $120 a night. Yeah. I mean, everyone's going there. Was it anyways? called the janky hotel? It no. was not. I'm describing <laughs> it as janky. I don't want to say what hotel it was, but it was janky. If you're interested, you can message us on Instagram at Travel Squad Podcast and we'll tell you what hotel they stayed in so that you don't make be- the same mistake. Yeah. So you guys don't make the same mistakes. So everyone's going to the area anyways. So they don't feel like they have to upkeep. And it's literally in the middle of nowhere. So a lot of the hotels were jankety looking hotels. And ours, were there any good ones? Yeah, they were. But yeah. they were in like the 250 to 350 dollar range. So if you're splitting it with a group of four, that's it might true. be true. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. If we were traveling with you ladies and it was a squad trip, we probably would have done that. But we weren't traveling with anybody. Yes, Brittany's sister was there and niece, but her cousin was driving back to El Paso. So her sister didn't want to share a room. So we just stayed where we stayed. But the best hotel that I saw from the outside seemed to be a Holiday Inn Express. And we looked at it and it was like 275 for a night. Wow. You know they had free breakfast there. Ooh. I, they did have free breakfast there. But you know what? I saved myself a little bit of money and just stayed at this hotel. Did the Janky Hotel have free breakfast? It actually did have free breakfast. I mean, it wasn't anything special. We did eat there one of the days. What, what kind of breakfast was it? Did I they guess? have a waffle maker? No waffle They did maker. not have a waffle <laughs> waffle maker i don't know take us through the spread it wasn't very good like scrambled eggs i think they were like powdered scrambled eggs maybe they had eggs yeah Yeah. better or worse than the mexico city hotel where we couldn't exactly tell what those eggs were worse maybe probably equal i would say equal equal or worse not better but no, that, that <laughs> breakfast was nothing to write home about. But the morning we woke up, which was Saturday, we had gone to Denny's. So Brittany's Denny's. favorite place. Denny's. You guys, Denny's holds a special place in Jamal's heart. Yeah, I used to work Brittany there. Brittany loves Denny's. <laughs> I don't love Denny's. But anyway, we went there with Brittany's sister and our niece. Because they were going to leave and continue on to Dallas, Texas. And Jamal and I were going to head to Guadalupe Mountains National Park. Yeah, so Guadalupe Mountains National National Park is in Texas. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Carlsbad Cavern is in the southern portion of New Mexico and Guadalupe Mountains National Park is in Texas, just right across that border. And it's only a one hour drive from that southern portion of New Mexico to get into Texas to Guadalupe Mountains because it's right on the border there. So really, really close to each other. What does Guadalupe Mountains National Park look like? It looks like a whole bunch of mountains. And so it actually holds the highest peak in Texas in this park Ooh. and so that is one of the draws of the park a lot of trees not a lot of trees oh. because it's i mean it's desert oh so i really actually wanted to hike guadalupe peak which is the highest peak in texas but it was an eight and a half mile hike to climb to the top of texas is what they call it but it's eight two, and a half miles up no round trip round trip okay okay but it was too hot because we went in the middle of july and there's no shade along the trail and also we were going to stick it out but when we asked the ranger he said that there had been a recent cougar sighting Ooh, cougars cougar on the trail zana you look scared pass 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 well we passed as well because we went into the visitor center before the hike again just to get a recommendation from the park ranger or one of the rangers because as Brittany said, she really wanted to do this particular hike. I did too, but he said it was an excessively hot day. There's not a lot of shade. There's been serious cougar sightings on the trail. Serious Serious sightings. Not just like, oh, one person said it. Like multiple people have been coming back and it's kind of been in the area. What temperature was it? Oh, it was easily like 98 degrees. And we got there at maybe... (laughs) nine in the morning yeah and, and that's already not when you want to be hiking no not at all not at all so it was already really hot and clearly projected to get hotter for the day so he said there's not really a lot of shade if you had that backpack full of water it could be enough but he's like i really wouldn't push it so he gave us another recommendation to hike and we did devil's hall instead which is a really really cool hike but before we get into that i wanted to touch a little bit more about guadalupe
Guadalupe Mountains because you asked the question, Kim, like, what can you expect? What does it look like? And mm-hmm. like Brittany said, it is the highest peak in Texas, but it's also famous and is a national park because it is the world's most extensive Permian fossil reef. And Guadalupe Mountains was at one time millions of years ago covered with water. And the Permian period was the last period of the Paleozoic area, which was about 541 million years ago. So a really, really long time. So the Permian period was of that era of time. And so there were fossil forests that they have there. So you can see like ancient fossilized coral and other things in that area. So so it is really cool. Yeah. And like I said, this park does have Texas's highest peak, but it also holds in general four of the highest peaks in Texas overall. And it just has a very diverse plant and animal life as well inside the park. But clearly they've got cougars. Yeah, they got cougars. So like Jamal said, we ended up hiking Devil's Hall instead. And this is a hike that I had done some research on. So it was kind of my backup hike anyways. And the ranger did recommend it. It was about 3.8 miles. So four miles round trip. And what was really cool about it is after the first mile, the trail enters like a rocky wash. So what may have been like an old riverbed perhaps. And it leads you to a really nice natural rock staircase. And that staircase case is what leads to the hallway that is called Devil's Hall. And it's called that because it's a hallway formed by really steep canyon walls. Mm. It sounds pretty. It was a really, really cool hike. And certain areas of this hike were shaded, not necessarily by trees, but because you were in a slight little canyon or river wash, you did have protection from those walls to your side. But there was certain spots where you were exposed to the sun. But for the most part, if you had a hat on, your sunscreen, definitely a good hike to do in such heat if you're in that area at that time. So this was the only hike we did in this national park. And after we finished this hike, we drove back to Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And the reason why we went back to Carlsbad Caverns National Park is like we said, the previous day we had hiked from the bottom out through the natural entrance. And this day we wanted to hike through the natural entrance back into the cave and then take the elevator up. Did you have to pay another 15 No, good question. I was just about to say that your entrance ticket to Carlsbad Cavern is good for three days. So that national park entrance is per person because you're going to a cave. It's not like other ones where you pay per vehicle Mm -hmm. or something to that effect. It is per person. But I think since it is cost per person, they do allow you multiple days and we had three days with it. So after our hike, we went back to Carlsbad Cavern, like Brittany said, hiked in through the natural entrance. Didn't really do too much sightseeing because we had already seen it, but just wanted to hike into it and take the elevator back out. Very cool. That's actually a good tidbit of information for our listeners. Most national parks that you go to, maybe all of them, maybe you guys know for sure, but most of them at least do when you pay your entrance fee, it usually is by car. It's good for three or seven days. Yeah, it usually ranges whether it's per person. So some of them are per person and it'll give you like a few days or if it's by car, it's usually seven days. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. So we went back and then that night, Brittany and I were left all alone. Didn't have any of her family left with us. And what did we do for dinner that night, Brittany? Mm, wonder what you did. <laughs> well, there wasn't much to do in Chili's. Carlsbad. No <laughs> we, and we, we already we stepped went to it up from Chili's. We stepped it up from Chili's. You already yeah. hit up Hakkasan too. Yeah. We <laughs> Hakkasan, New Mexico. <laughs> so we went to, we got wild and we went to Buffalo Wild Wings. Whoa. Whoa. We got real classy. We oh stepped my. it up from Chili's to Buffalo Wild Wings. Wild, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> so nothing too exciting that night at all. But one thing I want to say is at night at Carlsbad Caverns, they do offer a bat show. Do you remember that, Jamal? Yeah, I don't really remember what time it was specifically, but it usually is around dusk. So the time will change from month to month depending on when it does get dark. And the purpose of the show is to see the bats fly out of the cave at dusk dusk to do their hunting for food, clearly usually for insects or whatever it is that they're eating. So they have a little amphitheater area where you can go and see and watch all of the hundreds of thousands of bats Mm. fly out of the cave. Cool. We didn't get to do that, unfortunately. Do you remember why we didn't do it? I think we were so tired from all of the traveling we had done and it was another drive back to the park after dinner. So we just decided not to, but it is something I would do if I were back in the area. Yeah, in hindsight, I really 
regret that. Yeah, now that Brittany's saying that, it is ringing a bell to me. I remember we were just tired from our hike earlier, being exposed to the sun, and we were waking up early on Sunday anyway to do another hike at Carlsbad Cavern National Park. And when we did it the first day, we were originally talking about the big room that they have. But there is another area of Carlsbad Cavern National Park that isn't readily available to the public. You actually have to get guided tours with rangers and pay an additional cost for that tour. So the big room is the upper level, but they do have a lower cave below that. And Brittany and I were doing an early morning hike in the lower cave of Carlsbad Cavern. Yeah, so I was the one that booked this for Jamal's birthday weekend. Reservations are required because only 12 people are allowed with the guide at one time. So if you want to book this trail or a different trail that they offer, because they offer several different ones and they range from different time frames of the day, how many people can be on the trail and how strenuous it is. They are all on recreation.gov. For this trail in particular, this is a lower cave trail. It was $20 per person on top of, you know, your entrance fee that we had already paid for. That was $15, but it was so worth it. You get two guides. They tell you information about the cave and what you're going to be seeing that day. They give you your gear, so your helmets, your headlights, your gloves, and you have to wear really good shoes with grip because you are going to be rappelling down ropes, climbing down narrow ladders. It is a very interactive, hands-on hike. Nice. What kind of shoes did you have on? We had our normal hiking shoes. At least my hiking shoes that I have have really, really good grip on them, so I didn't use anything in particular they're special, just my normal hiking shoes. I did the same, but they have said in the past, like people have tried to go in with like open toed shoes or sandals and like that's definitely (laughs) not allowed. Dang. You don't want to get hurt. They don't actually let you do it, though. No? I mean, if you're going... No, they, no. Would, they would tell you, no, you can't do it. Absolutely. They're not going to let you in with that. It's a safety hazard. So like Brittany said, they give you all the gear that you need, your helmet, gloves, headlights. And the reason why you need the helmet with a headlamp is because in the big room on top, it is lit up because everybody's in there. But in the lower cave, they don't have any lights set up whatsoever. So it is completely pitch black. The only light you have is the light that's being emitted from your helmet. So that in and of itself was surreal to just go down and see the cave and be there in pitch black. Serious question. Did it have any bathrooms down there? No No bathrooms bathrooms down there. Very good point. We're about to mention that. (laughs) No bathrooms. You can't take Was there an NSOT issue? There was no NSOT (laughs) issue. And like we said, no bathrooms and you can't take a backpack down there. You could only take really like a fanny pack or something small to hold your water bottle but that's really about it yeah because like we said you're rappelling down ropes and you're going down ladders so you have to have your hands free so they don't let you bring in extra stuff because one they don't want you to spill it ruin it whatever and they don't want you to get hurt if your hands aren't free while you're traversing the terrain serious question for you what did you guys do for your phone because if you put it in your pocket and you're traversing and it might fall out so how did you carry that i just had mine in my pocket but i had my hiking pants and my hiking pants have like a zip cargo pocket Ah. so it was stuck in there for me i don't know what bernie did with hers well it was cold in the cave you know it's 56 degrees down there so i was wearing a windbreaker jacket and my windbreaker jacket has a pocket that is zippered so i zippered it into that Ah. yeah i don't think i would take my phone unless i had something to zipper it into yeah and so this tour was a three hour guided tour so you start up in the visitor center they take you through the briefing they give you all of your equipment and then you take the elevator down into the cave. They tell you, use the bathroom. It's going to be a three hour tour. There's no bathrooms on the trail. And to get to the lower cave, it's from the big room. So off to the side where we had hiked the previous day and we didn't even notice it, there is a rope that is just along the wall and they lower the rope down into this canyon and they say, okay, this is how you traverse down into the lower cave. And they show you how to go down it backwards, essentially. Yeah, we had to rappel down the rope. And then once we got to that level, then there was a series of ladders like that we had to ladders. climb that were super narrow. For the rappelling part, how far down was it? I would say maybe 25 feet of rappelling. Ooh. Yeah, I would say so that. So quite a bit of rappelling. And they made us do all these safety features like you would have to say off rope, you know, when you were done. So <laughs> nobody else pulled it while you were Tim on it or something to that effect. Was it lit up? In the lower cave? As you were rappelling down. Yes, it was because it's coming from the upper cave cave big room that we were talking about. So once you rappel down into that area and we get to the ladders, then 
and it's not lit anymore. All the light is coming from your headlamp. And, and this is why there's a maximum amount of 12 people per tour because you can't be on the rope at the same time as someone else. You can't be on the ladder as the same time as someone else. So you have to say like on ladder, off ladder, on rope, off rope. And so it's a series of 12 people plus the guides doing this. So that does take a bit of time just to get down into the lower cave and out of the lower cave. Were there any children in your guys' group? No. And there's actually like an age limit. I'm not sure what it is, but there is an age limit. And on this hike, you have to be able to like crawl through some spaces. So if you're not comfortable or can't do that, then you're not able to do the hike. Yeah, but it was really cool down there because like I said, it's just such an amazing contrast in the big room at the upper level. Again, everything is lit up so you can see in there. No issues whatsoever. But once you get down there, it's completely pitch black. And again, all the lights coming from your headlight. And so you just get a really distinctive tour and see a portion of the cave that most people who go don't get to see. And that was really unique. And one part in particular that really sticks out is we had to crawl through a little opening and it took us to this small room. And what did they have us do when we were in there, Brittany? They had us turn off our headlamps and sit in pitch black darkness for a while or just to experience it real quick. Well, it was told to us to just experience, but he had us keep it off for a while and was talking to us with the lights off. And he was telling us history and other information about ghost stories. the caves. No, no ghost mm-hmm. stories. But he was just saying, like, <laughs> imagine the early days of exploring yeah. down here. Like, if you lost your light, we're in the middle, literally, of nowhere. How are you going to find your way out? He's like, this is a death sentence. So it was almost like a humbling experience to see this cave in pitch black. And it's crazy. Like, literally no light can come from anywhere and you're done. Like, I can't imagine exploring something back in that day and having your light go out. And like Jamal said, we were in the lower cave and we crawled into a even smaller cave and then turned off our headlamp. So it was just like, we were all sitting there like cross-legged in this tiny space that we all crawled through and then just all of a sudden the lights go out and it's pitch black. It just makes me so sad thinking about like people who might have died down there. Yeah, I mean, he didn't say people have. Caves cave are that, dangerous. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure any cave that's been explored has had somebody who's lost their life in it. But even though it was in a safe setting, that was a truly humbling experience because when he's talking to you and you're really thinking about it, like I was thinking like, shit, what if I was really exploring down here or for whatever reason, all of our headlamps got cracked. And here we are just like stuck in this pitch black. Like, how are we getting out of here? So intense, really humbling feeling. One other highlight of this tour is they took us to an area called the Rookery. And along it, you're walking on this pathway and on either side of you is water and these tiny little things that are called cave pearls, but it just looks like so beautiful that there's all of these beautiful circular white shaped pearls in this water. It was so cool to see. So after spending three hours in the lower cave, we made our way back up and that concluded our experience and time at Carlsbad Cavern National Park. And I just want to say again, been in caves before, but every time I go in, I think I know what I'm going to see, what to expect because I've seen it before. But each time it's just such an amazing experience because nature's amazing. So beautiful in there. It's like no matter what national park you go to, you just feel so small in comparison to all of these structures. And when you say we drove back up, you do mean we drove back up to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yes. Did you guys do anything in Albuquerque? Is there anything to do there? We did a couple things in Albuquerque. Interestingly enough, right before we had gone on this trip, I came across a BuzzFeed thread that listed the best tacos in every state. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I saw that the best tacos in New Mexico happened to be in Albuquerque. So I told Mm. Brittany that night, Sunday or last night before we fly back home Monday morning, let's go there. So we ended up going to El Paisa Taqueria. And again, according to the BuzzFeed thread, listed as having the best tacos in New Mexico. And it was really, really good. Do I think it's the best tacos? No, I've had better here in San Diego. in the state of New Mexico. I guess. Maybe. Well, those are the only tacos I've ever had in New Mexico. So I don't really know otherwise <laughs> that they're worse. Well, Chili's doesn't count. <laughs> Chili's <laughs> definitely doesn't count. So we did that. And Brittany and I are both breaking bad fans. And that takes place in Albuquerque. So what did we do, Brittany? 
You know, we love to drive by famous houses. So we drove by the Breaking Bad house. How was it? Thrilling? No, because, and I had read this in advance, that when you drive by, you do not want to park directly in front of the house because the lady that owns the house is sitting on the lawn in the chair yelling at people like, don't, don't park here. Don't stop and look. And like, she's really mean. And so you should look at it from afar. And she's really fenced off the whole house area just as well, too. So the house itself still looks the same as it did in the show because they leased out that house from the owners of it. And they haven't done any remodeling to the outside or anything. Again, it looks exactly the same. But they do have a big fence because apparently a lot of people would trespass on it. And there's a very famous scene where the main character, Walter White, he throws a pizza on the roof. And supposedly a lot of people who were Breaking Bad (laughs) fan tourists would go and throw a pizza. Uh, oh like on gosh. the roof <laughs> so they got tired of it and they block it off but that same thread that Brittany read saying that the woman owner of the house definitely doesn't like the tourism that it's brought so she's out watching if the husband's out I've heard he's a little bit more friendlier don't know didn't see him can't say but we just parked on that street looked at it for a little bit and said do you remember this scene where he came driving with the car barreling through the neighborhood like on this street right here is like this is it like we watched the show is really cool in that respect yeah Yeah, actually, you mentioned that there's actually more than one way to enter the street. And so I pulled up a map and I said to Jamal, we've always watched them enter the street from a specific angle. So why don't we enter from the same angle? So we kind of get that breaking bad view like we were there. Ooh, look at that. It was actually really fun. Uh, But I mean, I love TV. One of my favorite shows, love Breaking Bad. So it was cool. Other stuff to do in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don't really know. Again, we were so tired. We just checked into our hotel. They didn't have a breakfast buffet, but they did have in the lobby areas for us to pick up like fruit, granola bars, things like that. So we grabbed a few things for the morning of because we had an early morning Monday flight so we can go back to work per norm. Do you recall the name of the hotel you stayed in in Albuquerque? And was it close to the airport? Yeah, so it was close to the airport and it was an extended stay America. Ah, so it had a kitchen. It did have a kitchen. But we weren't there long enough to buy supplies to use the kitchen. No, we did make oatmeal don't you remember that we made oatmeal in the morning they had little oatmeal packets and we made that in the morning before we left yeah but we just microwaved it though i didn't cook it on the stove i don't think so i didn't use the kitchen i used a microwave i guess so that's maybe why i'm (laughs) thinking it's usually in the kitchen yeah but all in all (laughs) fun birthday weekend trip nature i just can't say this enough nature gets me going just like ancient runes and buildings get you going (laughs) nature gets me going nature gets me going too when jamal and i went you know he was giving me shit about like why don't you just let me have a birthday to do nothing why are we always hiking (laughs) on my birthday once we did carlsbad caverns after the day ended he looked at me and said you know this is a really cool birthday trip i'm really glad we came doesn't he say that every year yeah he does (laughs) i told you i know i do it's just you know sometimes Sometimes I'm stubborn and just want to You relax. stubborn? No. I All know. the time you're stubborn. Uh, you know what, makes Jamal? Me stubborn. When I saw you guys' pictures on Facebook, especially with the headlight on your head, I was so jealous. Oh, the pictures look amazing. Yeah. This place is so cool looking. Really, really yeah. cool. And that's part of the time that it takes for you to explore the areas is you're trying to get the best pictures. But because it's in that really dim lighting, some parts it's dark, it's hard to get a really good picture with your phone because there's not a lot of light. And if you want tips about getting the perfect shot, check out episode five in Sequoia and Kings Canyon, where Jamal and Kim give the their best tips. Yes. We'll have a whole episode on travel photography coming up. Yeah. So Kim, you've been so patient. It is finally questions of the week. Questions of the week. My voice isn't as good as yours. That's actually really embarrassing. (laughs) I'm going to wish I didn't say that. Questions (laughs) of of the the week. week. (laughs) (laughs) All right. What do we got this week, Kim? I love it. Um, All right. Jen from Boulder. Hey, Jen. She asked, how many national parks have you guys been to? Oh, wow. As you can tell, we have been to a lot. I myself have been to 25 total 
Brittany and I together, 23. So I don't know which number to count because I like to count the parks that Brittany and I have been to together, but I've been to Yosemite and Yellowstone without Brittany. So total 25, but truly 23 together. I have been to 24 national parks. So the one that I have not been to with Jamal is Yosemite. He's been to it himself, but we went separately. So we did not go together. Like you said, together we've been to 23. Jen, I have no idea. So because of this question, I counted it out with Jamal and Brittany, and it was 14. And I know that I've been to 13 national parks because I recently just got a gift from my grandma, which is a big map of the United States, and you can scratch off every national park as you do it. So I counted, and I've been to 13. Shout out, Linda. Thanks for that gift. Shout out, Grandma. And then we have one more question. All right. This one is coming from Deja in La Mesa. So I love it. Deja is also your guys' niece's name. Yes, it is. is. Name twins. So Deja asks, how do you pick what national park you are going to next? Ooh, I know the answer to this. Now I'm going to be using my map because I can really see how close they are. Like we got to go to Alaska. There's so many there. Yeah, there's no Hawaii. Alaska. There's two. Yep. Alaska, but they're on different islands. Alaska has the most national parks out of any state, but of the 48 contiguous, California has the most and then Utah. So those That's two true. are the clusters of more reasonable. But yes, Alaska would be amazing, but it's so big, so far apart. So I am such a fan of national parks. I actually decided to make a PowerPoint. I'm so nerdy. What? I made a PowerPoint of every single national park, the best time of year to go to the national park, how much the entrance fees cost, and what I would like to do if I were to visit that a national PowerPoint? park. A PowerPoint? And yes. the nearest airport on where to go to. You a PowerPoint. Seem, a PowerPoint. You seem so surprised, Kim. I feel like she's told you this before. I mean, a PowerPoint deck doesn't seem like the best I was shocked when she it. did it on what? a PowerPoint as Power- well. But I Excel. I would think Excel would be a good place for that. I, I would have to show you how it's set up, but <laughs> <laughs> I made this PowerPoint. It talks about the closest airports to get to these national parks as well. And it also gives little tips like if you were to go to this national park, these national parks are also in the area. So you can make it a weekend trip, a week trip if there's a lot nearby. Zena, you look flabbergasted. I, I just didn't know this. If you would like a copy of Brittany's infamous National Park PowerPoint, we are going to be giving the first three people to leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts and email us a screenshot of it, travelsquadpodcast at gmail.com. The first three people that give us that review and send us that email, we will send you a copy of the PowerPoint so you can plan all your National Park trips yourself. Not just any review, five-star review. Yeah, one star, no thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So along with my PowerPoint, I look at the Southwest sales or airline sales to see where are the cheapest destinations to go to. I see the cities and I think, okay, is there a close national park to this area? And that's essentially how I pick my next trip. It's like when we did Chicago. We did Chicago because we want to go to Chicago and Indiana Dunes National Park is close by. It's like when we go to Vegas and Zion is a quick drive away, you know. So a lot of times it's dictated, like Brittany said, on what is close to us in the area and what's feasible. We haven't really hit a lot of East Coast National Parks because it's a lot harder to do those in a weekend. Those invest, you know, taking time off of work, maybe utilizing it as a vacation. So a lot of the West Coast parks usually but now we're running out of those so we're gonna have to figure out a new strategy for those east we're coast in parks. luck though because a lot of them are on the western side of the united states yes we are in luck and we have a upcoming trip to two national parks anyone want to tell Ooh, i don't know if we've told anybody this yet you guys we are going to yellowstone national park and then we're gonna go to disneyland Woo! i'm just kidding yeah Yellow- <laughs> yellowstone national park is one and And grand tetons national park is the other they're right by each other so we're doing a nice is it seven days six days i think six day six day exploration of bison and hiking and bears and cougars zana i was just about to say (laughs) i was waiting for kim to finish her sentiment so i could say no cougars allowed and i had no idea that we're going to grand tetons yes i'm a part of the trip but uh, that's why i didn't answer the second one because i only knew the first wyoming and montana yep crossing off some more states on our state bucket list. 
Hey guys, we're almost done with the episode. Any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Actually, yes, I had one that just came to me. What's up? So in the visitor center of Carlsbad Caverns National Park, they have a replica of what the cave looks like. And you can really see a miniature model of the area and what you're hiking into. And so it displays the lower cave, the big room, the natural entrance, and even other parts of the cave that you can't get to. Oh, that's cool. So it'd probably be cool to check it out before you start your hiking so you can kind of know what you're in. Yeah, it's like a, it. it's like a scaled model that they have and it shows the paths and cool. have the upper to the lower. And it's really, really interesting to see. Definitely cool to check out when you're in the visitor center. Very nice. All right. Well, that's all we got for you. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode. Keep the adventure going with us by following us on Instagram at Travel Squad Podcast and tag us in all of your adventures and send us those questions of the week. And if you found the information in this episode to be useful or you thought we were just plain funny, please share it with a friend that would enjoy it too. Please subscribe, rate and review our podcast and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We are going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be sharing with you how travel changed our lives. Woo! Such a big way. Yeah. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.